Our scripture today comes out of the Gospel according to Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. It's an interesting text. Uh, it starts out that Jesus is equipping his disciples. This is early on in his ministry, and he's taking the disciples out, and guess what? Surprise, surprise, good things are happening. People are being healed. People are interested to the attention of King Herod. Well, because it brings him to the attention of King Herod, we're told this story about the death of John the Baptist. Okay? So follow along with me here. Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. It says, King Herod heard of all that good stuff Jesus was doing. For Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others say it is Elijah. And others said it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested Jesus, bound him, put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with the orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This week I had an elders meeting, and Howie Sutliff asked me to give a devotion. There wasn't a lot of stuff for the elders to talk about. He knew there'd be some extra time. He asked me to give a devotion. And in the context of the devotion, I mentioned that sometimes we feel a little trapped in places and uh, one of the things that I mentioned was that uh, I have oftentimes felt trapped at funerals and even though this was only supposed to be a very brief moment of the meditation uh, the elders were extremely interested in why I felt trapped at funerals and, and I said well first off uh, sometimes the pastor can really fall in love with the sound of his or her voice and just want to go on and on and on and on and go forever. I said, I, I don't like that. But I said, even more, I despise being at funerals when the pastor decides that this is a wonderful opportunity to pull out every single scripture that he or she can find about hell. And read that verse about hell and this verse about hell and every single verse about hell. And then once he or she does that, you know what they have to do. They have to pull out every single verse about heaven. So they can read every verse in the book of the Bible about heaven, about how bad hell is, and about how great heaven is. And all of a sudden, it's like, now why are we here? Oh yeah, somebody died. But I feel like the pastor sometimes at those funerals just feels like, I have a captive audience, and out of honor for the dead, they're going to sit through this miserable sermon and listen to me. And that's exactly what I do. I might complain a little bit. My brother said to me the other day, he goes, this is a terrible sermon. 
this is a terrible funeral. I said, yes, it is. <laughs> it is. But those funerals, I mean, I have definitely felt trapped at funerals before. The elders were very interested in this. But this idea of being trapped, I think, is exactly what's going on in our scripture for the disciples of John the Baptist. They are not trapped in a bad funeral, but they are trapped in a bad place in life. You ever been trapped in a bad place of life? That place of life where it's like, wow, I would rather wake up in the morning with my head sewn to the carpet than have to endure another day <laughs> that starts out like this. Trapped. John the Baptist is their leader. And John the Baptist is no small figure in the Bible. He precedes Jesus. So before Jesus even comes out, he's out there saying, hey, you know what? As many great things are happening in this ministry, as many people are being baptized into God, there's somebody coming that's even greater than I am, and his name is Jesus. And so John the Baptist prepared the way for his cousin, Jesus, to come and share God's love with us. Well, John wasn't the kind of guy that minced words. You know, people that when they have a thought, they bring it up. Well, when he was around King Herod, that's what he did. King Herod decided it was okay to marry his brother's wife. And so he told him, he said, hey, it's not right to marry your brother's wife. And uh, King Herod was able to deal with that, but his wife Herodias was not so pleased about it. And so she had it out for John. And even though King Herod didn't want John to die, she waited for an opportunity. And so here Herod throws a big birthday party. And the truth is, they were a bit tanked. They drank way too much. And so Herod's daughter comes out and, and dances, and King Herod is like, oh, you did such a great job, sweetie. A great job. I'll tell you what, I will give you whatever you ask for, even to half of the kingdom. And so she decides, I'm going to go ask my mother, what should I ask of King Herod? Her mother says, I'll tell you what, you need to ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now, even though this happened in olden times of antiquity, cutting somebody's head off and handing it to somebody on a platter, this is a horrible, horrible thing. One of the most amazing parts of this scripture, if you ask me, is the very last verse. With after all of this drama and all this stuff that's taken place, the very last verse is void of any kind of emotion. It just says, when John's disciples heard what had happened, they found the body, they laid it in the tomb. Period. Nothing else. I'll bet they didn't have a lot to say. I can't imagine being trapped in the time and place that they were where they had to deal with the questions of God, how, how could this happen? And how could such a faithful servant of God have something so terrible happen and die so inhumanely? I imagine their grief and their sadness was overwhelming. And really, if you read through that scripture, the sadness comes through. As I was trying to prepare for this sermon, normally I'll read through a scripture and Shortly after, I figure out what I'm going to preach on. This one was confusing to me because there's a whole lot going on, which means normally that means there's a lot to choose from to preach a sermon. But when I read this sermon, I couldn't think of anything to preach on. Or when I read this scripture, and all I could feel was sadness. I couldn't even think of anything to preach on. I just felt sadness because there's so, it's just a very, very sad scripture about what happened. It's it's very inhumane. It's very sad. And as I continue to pray about it and say, well, Lord, what is the good news here? What is the good news that I'm to share with your people, Lord? 
And after a while, it came to me. Sad times are going to happen, right? Part of any spiritual journey, we go through times of discouragement. We go through times of grief. We go through times of sadness. It's just part of the journey. We can't avoid them. We will encounter them. Hopefully not to the level of our brothers and sisters back then. But that's rough. But we do. There are times that are just inherently sad in our lives. And it's during those times of sadness that we're called to have a certain kind of faith. A certain kind of faith, it's, it's what I call faith with teeth. A faith that's rugged. A faith that is tough. A faith that is not easily dissuaded. A faith that is committed to being resilient and hanging in there. Because that's exactly the kind of faith that John's disciples needed to have in this time of sadness. A time of faith that was tough and rugged and willing to hang in there. I don't think we usually think about faith in different ways, but the truth is there are different types of faith out there. Not all faiths are necessarily faith with teeth. Maybe you've heard of the uh, McDonald's Big Mac faith. Have you ever heard of that? McDonald's Big Mac faith. It's the faith that starts out really big, but over time, it gets a lot smaller. Remember when Big Macs actually were big? Now they just put the word big next to them, just so you know they're supposed to be big, right? Am I wrong? In the 1970s, Big Macs were enormous. They were like half a car size. Now, they're the size of little tiny cheeseburgers. Still delicious, but very small. But sometimes our faith is like that. It starts out strong. It starts out we're enthusiastic about it. But over time, we just lose that enthusiasm. Our interests go to other things. And our faith just becomes mundane. The McDonald's Big Mac faith. If you haven't heard of the McDonald's Big Mac faith, maybe you've heard of the late night nacho faith. Anybody ever hear of the late night nacho faith? Yes. Thank God bless you. I appreciate your honesty here. worships late night nachos. The late night nacho faith has no self-control whatsoever. You know, as followers of Jesus, we are called, we're called to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. We're called to be directed by the power of God's presence in our lives. But late night nachos, we are just controlled with whatever we want, right? Late night nacho faith says, I want it, so I'm going to take it. And with late night nacho faith, it's very hard for God to really have his way in our lives. So that late night nacho faith is not the kind of faith that you need to have to get you through times of sadness. Maybe you've heard of the State Farm Insurance faith, where, boom, God is right there as soon as you call on God to deliver you the holiest of all things, and that is instant gratification. Give it up for instant gratification. Isn't instant gratification amazing? Instant gratification. I do. I love instant gratification. That's oftentimes the kind of response we want from faith. Is that we just call on God and whatever we want, God just makes it happen. Just like that. The only problem with that is during times of sadness, discouragement, instant gratification it just doesn't normally happen. And that's not the kind of faith that we can use to really get us through times of difficulty, times of inherent sadness. But we need that faith with teeth that will not give up, that will stay the course, that will trust God, one that will be tough. Faith with teeth. My girlfriend, Samantha, is, uh, she's one of these people that, like, if I need something put together, I'm always like, hey, sweetie, can you come over and put such and such together? I know, I'm supposed to be the guy that does that, right? 
But um, if it was always up to me, uh, it would probably not get done the right way, or I'd have to do it like six times, and she's really good at it, so she just puts stuff together the right way the first time. It's, it's a gift that she has. So she's also a good shopper, and she got online, and uh, she found a $500 uh, outdoor wicker set, a three-piece, for $78, including shipping on Amazon. Wow. So she's like, yeah, I'll take one of those. So she, she got it shipped to her. I think it must have been a mistake or something. That was crazy. It, it probably cost over $100 to send it. It was really heavy. So anyway, she says, well, you've got to take it to your house because you've got a nice patio. And I said, all right, I can do that. So this outdoor furniture's there. And, and uh, so she rips open the boxes and she starts to put it together. Now, I'm, not, I'm just like, wow, she's a, she's a go-getter. That's really great. I, I kind of waved at her, you know, and, and uh, said hi, and saw how she, but she just kept going. She just kept putting it together, and I was like really impressed. Well, after a while, I go down, and I'm, I take her some coffee, ask her how it's going. She says, oh, it is fine. And, and I noticed that this, this Allen key is all that came with it. Now, keep in mind, this is a three-piece set of wicker furniture, and this is what they gave to put it together. This tiny little hex key. And um, I could see her kind of struggling, but she was making some progress. I offered to go get like a really nice hex key, and she declined. And so after about the third time, I said, I don't care what you're gonna what you say, I'm just going to get one. So I get back with it, and I'm really happy. I'm like, well, she's going to really love putting it together with, with actually something that's easy to use. And uh, so she stops when I get there. And we're talking, and pretty soon I'm like, hey, well, I just went and bought this. Are you going to use the nice one that I brought you? And she looks at me, and she says, well, there were some pretty hard spots there, and uh, the palm of my hand is so bruised that I... I can't actually turn anything anymore. And so I said, well, um, I said, I can't put this together on my own, but if you just tell me what to do, I can do that. Any, anybody know guys like that? So, so I take that and I finally, with her instruction, we finally get that three piece set together. She came over to the house after the service and just, just, just look at it and take in that beautiful view. But there were some times when I was using the nice Allen key when it was so difficult to turn that I thought it was going to break it. I thought it was going to break the brand new Allen key, the nice one. That's how hard it was. And she says, oh, yeah. She's like, I had a bunch of those, too. <laughs> she just happened to do them with this instead. But, you know... To me, that's like faith that has teeth in it. A faith that's tough, a faith that's resilient. One that won't give up easily when difficult times come. That's faith with teeth that are committed to seeing things through even when it's tough. But there's one thing about faith with teeth that we ought to know, and that is that it doesn't usually just pop up overnight. It's not like you're like, oh, Pastor, I agree with you. I'm From this point on, I'm just going to have faith with teeth. Tough faith that hangs in there right now from now on. Well, I hope that I'm wrong, but that doesn't usually happen that way. A faith that can endure, like we're talking about, comes out of a relationship with Jesus. Now, keep in mind, I didn't say it just believes in Jesus, it comes out of an actual relationship with the Lord. A relationship, one in which God is part of your life, where you talk to God, you share with God, you invite God to fill you, and God's presence to fill you. A relationship, that's where faith is nurtured and grown. A faith that endures, a faith that has some real teeth in it, it comes out of making the scriptures a priority in our lives. So often, we can have these books of the Bible sitting in our homes, 
and we may even see them. But to actually make the scriptures a prayer in life, I'm going to go out on one here. I want to say we actually need to take our hands, put them on the Bible, actually open them up. Is this a novel concept for us? <laughs> open them up. This, this is what the inside looks like. Right? Witchcraft. Yes. <laughs> I've never actually seen that. Exactly. I know. The Bible does open. But a faith that endures. If we make the scriptures a priority in our lives, if we learn the scriptures, if we seek to understand them, if we learn the stories, they're designed to help faith spring forth in our lives. Faith with teeth is nurtured by making prayer a priority. We don't have to pray for hours at a time, although if you want to, that's great. It doesn't hurt. But even if you just use times throughout the day where you regularly acknowledge God's presence in your life, where you regularly pray, even if it's just a brief moment throughout the day, multiple times, make prayer a priority. It nurtures that kind of faith. Faith with teeth, it's nurtured by making worship a priority. Where it's something that we crave, something we want to do, something where even when it's difficult to get here, we decide, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway. Because it's here that we finally acknowledge, Lord, you're the most important part of my life. It's not whatever's on my agenda. God, it's you and that I need you. And that kind of faith nurture is nurtured when we worship. A faith with teeth is nurtured when we love other people so much that we don't find the need to be judgmental. Isn't that crazy? That we can actually love people so much that we don't find the need to be judgmental. It nurtures faith with teeth if we do that. One last thing. And that is after that very last scripture verse that says, when the disciples found the body, they laid it in it, they laid his body in the tomb. And then it just ends. The very next scripture is about Jesus feeding the 5,000. So basically what happens is, is that we have this time of sadness, and then the very next story is where Jesus' ministry takes off to do amazing things. 5,000 people are fed. People are listening and hanging on every word that comes out of Jesus' mouth. And Jesus' ministry begins to take off. So there's one thing to keep in mind. That the purpose of faith that has teeth in it, a faith that endures and hangs in there, the purpose isn't always just to get us through those times of sadness and difficulty. But it's also to get us to what God wants next in our lives. And it's a reminder that God wasn't through with his disciples. God's not through with you. God's not through with this church. So may we all open our hearts up to God and pray diligently that we have the kind of faith with teeth that John's disciples had in that scripture.